Father, you are a God that loves and cares. You are a God that doesn't tire. You are a God that called us your children. No matter what we've done, no matter how far we've tried to separate ourselves from you, you, Father, your love knows no bounds. Father, we thank you for taking all the ashes and creating beauty. We thank you, Father, that all we can do now when we see you and see your love and your work is to worship you and thank you and trust you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Hope Monco. We're so glad that you're here this morning and worshiping with us together this morning on the July 4th weekend. So happy 4th of July, firstly. And secondly, I, I just, just to give a little moment here, very, very grateful for all of you that we get to worship together and that we get to worship together in this country. Just very grateful for this country. With that being said, Hope Monco, we here exist to model the person and work of Jesus. That's what we do. And so we do that in worship, we do that in community, and we do that in our outreach. So please do continue to keep in mind how we can take the blessings that we received this morning and model it to each other. There's only one announcement this morning, which is our next potluck. Our next potluck is July 28th, the last Sunday of each month. The last Sunday of each month. With that being said, on the cross, when Jesus died, he brought peace between God and humanity. Let's take this time to pass that peace with each other by saying peace be with you, and we'll see you in a few moments. You can't cut in half horizontally because there's a severe disparity in the quality of the halves of the bagel. Because the top, and so who knows the cinnamon crunch bagel from Panera? Who knows what I'm talking about? Don't be shy. Listen, I can see everybody, so I know if you're just choosing to ignore me. Uh, the top is covered with that cinnamon crunch sugar stuff. It's amazing. The bottom is like a normal bagel bottom. <laughs> and so when, when they cut them in half and somebody takes the top, you just want to look at them and be like, you're a monster? Not cool? So, um, I, I love watching movies. I'm a huge movie fan. In fact, I've talked with some of you about movies that I like. Um, but when, and I've been married to Bethany, my wife, for, we've been together for almost 20, almost 20 years. And there's like stuff you learn about each other when you've been married that long. So she loves to watch movies with me. Um, but Bethany really likes to know stuff. And so what we found is it's not super enjoyable for one of us when we watch a movie together that I've already seen. Because what happens is lots of questions, like constantly, like, oh, who is that? It's just, you know, just keep watching. Oh, wait, well, what happens with that? It's like, just, just keep watching. To the point where I have had to apologize because my attitude stinks afterwards. I'll be like, okay, I'm sorry. I was unkind. That's fair. That's fair. But it's like, there's like a lot of questions about stuff. Like, oh, it's like, what about that? It's like, well, if I told you that now, that's the plot of the whole movie. So just keep watching. Just keep watching. It'll all make sense at some point, right? Because when you haven't seen something, it, you, we wonder how stuff fits together. And we wonder how the parts all connect. Uh, we only have a, a small picture of the whole, and it doesn't all make sense to us. And it's hard when you know the whole story and someone else doesn't because they want to look to you like, can you explain this? Like, like help it fill, it fill this all in for me. Help this make sense. But often the way to figure out the story, unless it's uh, like Memento by Christopher Nolan, in that case, I don't know how to make sense of that. But uh, most movies, like, just watch the whole thing. Just, it'll make sense in retrospect. Like, it'll make sense when we know all the parts, when it all comes together. And that's the same when we think of the Bible. We're in the, a series on Judges right now, and, uh, and my friend Jacob gave me a Judges 9 to talk about, which is like a really crazy story. If you're familiar, if you're not, that's okay, because we're going to talk about it right now. Um, think of Judges chapter 9 as like a brief interlude in Judges, right? I'm going to give you a little background, and then we'll dive in. Um, the main character is a guy named Abimelech. He's Gideon's, one of Gideon's sons, right? But Gideon is not a judge. He's very clearly not a judge. 
Uh, he's not a guy that God raised up to, to lead his people and care for his people. This is a, like a brief kind of interlude following the story of Gideon and Gideon's family. So Abimelech is not a judge. And there's three movements to the story because it's a long chapter. So we're going to, I hope you don't have afternoon plans. We're going to be here for a while. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that to you. Uh, so think of it in three movements. There's the rise, the revelation, and then the reign, all right? There's three movements to this, okay? So let's, let's talk. Starts in, and we got to start back in, in chapter 8 to kind of understand. So Jerubbabal was, is another name for Gideon. So when we talk about this, I'm going to say Gideon, but this, the text will say Jerubbabal sometimes. So Gideon brings peace to the land. Lisa talked a little bit about that last week. So there's peace for 40 years, and he, and he dies at a, at a ripe old age. And it says, verse 33 says, No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. The Baals being the Canaanite gods that, that were prevalent in the land in which they lived, right? Because they, pe- they defeated some of the people, but there were also people living there in the, in the new, new land of Israel. And so uh, these are some of the gods that they worshipped, and the Israelites, again, prostituted themselves to Baal. Never good when it's prostituted is used with, with the word again. It means like they've, this is their go-to move. They're doing it again. That's really the cycle of judges. They keep wandering away from God. And it says they set up, Baal Berit as their god. They set up a, a new god. As, that's Baal of the Covenant. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. So they've kind of wandered from God again. That's kind of what they do, right? And then chapter 9 starts. It says there's a guy named Abimelech. He's one of Gideon's sons. Gideon had a lot of sons. And he goes to his mom's family in Shechem. And he says to them, talk to all the people of Shechem and ask him this question, what's better, to have 70 sons of Gideon rule over you or just one man? And he's like, and remember, I'm your guy. Like, my mom is from here. Like, I'm one of your, you're my people. You're my clan. Like, so it's asking a very leading question. He's like, so what would you rather have? Like, imagine he's saying, like, 70 people, like 70 really, it's just going to be really a huge bureaucracy of 70 people. Or one awesome guy that, like, knows you. Hey, like I'm part of your clan. So these people go and they ask all the citizens of of Shechem and it's their inclined to follow Abimelech. And they say, yeah, because he's related to us. He gets us. He's one of us. So they gave him a bunch of money, 70 shekels of silver from the temple, which is a lot of money. And Abimelech used it to hire some bad dudes, to hire reckless scoundrels who became his followers. He basically built himself a mercenary army. All right, And then it says he went to his father's home in another town, and it says on one stone he murdered his 70 brothers. And the Hebrew there indicates that it was, it was likely execution style. Like this wasn't a pitched battle. Like he captured them, rounded them up, and then executed them. But one escaped by hiding. So we're like six verses into a 57-verse 57 57 chapter, and there's one thing that's very clear. Abimelech is not a good guy. Like, really, really not a good guy. Very much a bad guy. Right? So his younger brother, is Jotham, escapes. And Jotham climbs up on top of Mount Gerizim and shouts to them. And he's like, listen to me, you people. And he actually says, listen, so that God may listen to you. And there's some indication there that it's like that God's raising him up or God's using him to kind of intercede in this moment. And he tells them a story. Right? And it's significant he does this on Mount Gerizim. There's so many connections in this chapter, and I'm going to try and give you some, but if we did it all, we would be here for a very long time. But there's so many connections in this chapter. The significance of him going up on Mount Gerizim to tell this story that, that ends up being a, a, a curse is significant because previously Mount Gerizim was where the Israelites gathered around the foot of Mount Gerizim to hear the blessings of God pronounced over them. So the blessings of God are pronounced previously, but now the people are in a different place, and now a curse is pronounced. Jotham tells a story, right? So he goes, listen to me. Okay, one day the trees went out to anoint a king for themselves. That's a, like, let's just pause for a moment. I have so many questions. Why are the trees having a king? What does a king tree look like? Like, it's a weird image but he's telling a story in the, in the form of this hebrew parable so he goes all right fine so trees went out to anoint a king for themselves and they say to the olive tree be our king and the olive tree says i'm too valuable right my oil is too important my olives are too important i can't give those up to do this so they go to a fig tree 
be our king. And the fig tree says, I can't. I, my fruit's too important. It's too important a commodity. I can't do it. So then the, they go to the, the vine and say, be our king. And the vine says, I can't. My grapes, the, it, they're too important. Too important for wine. It's, too, it's a, the chief thing everybody drinks but water. Like it, it's too important. So they go to a thorn bush and say, come be our king. And the thorn bush says, my moment's come. I have nothing to offer. He actually says, and this is sarcastic, he goes, come take refuge in my shade. Do you know many thorn bushes that are, A, big enough to provide shade and, like, comfort? You ever climb into a thorn bush for fun? Like, I've had kids throw a Frisbee into a thorn bush and just thought, it's gone. We'll buy a new one. I'm not going in. It's not worth it. But he says, fine, if you really want to anoint me king over you, come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, then let fire come out of the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon, which are these massive trees to the north of them. That's a crazy story. It's an absolutely crazy story. It took me a couple reads to go, what? Like, what, what is happening there? Why is he saying this? But he uses that and he pivots to say, to sort of explain it. It's like, what you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is messed up. He says, if you acted honorably and in good faith by making Abimelech king, and he says that twice. He's trying to repeat that idea. He's trying to emphasize what you guys are doing is wrong. This idea of you acted honorably and in good faith carries with it the, the implication of breaking a contract or an agreement. Like they had an agreement with Gideon and his family, and they are violating that. And then he remembers them or reminds them. He says, remember, my father fought for you. Remember. What he did, remember, you've had peace for 40 years because my father fought for you. It's like, but you, you've revolted against my father's family. You've murdered 70 of his sons, and you've made Abimelech, and this is where he throws some serious shade at Abimelech, says the son of his female slave. What he basically is saying is his mom is my, was my dad's concubine, which is really, there's no other way to say it, it was like his mom's sex slave. He's like, your mom's not even like a real important person. She's this, you don't even matter. He's trying to lower his status. So he totally takes a shot at him. He's like, you've made him king just because he's related to you? So he says this again. Have you acted out? What you're doing is messed up. But he says, you make your own choice. You don't have to go down this road. But if you do, fine. You deserve each other. But if this doesn't work out, let fire come out from Abimelech and consume you. Let fire come out from you, the citizens of Shechem and Bet Milo, and consume Abimelech. Basically, if this doesn't work out, you guys are going to destroy each other. And then he flees, and then he, he, he escapes. Right? We're still working our way through the first third of the story. Three years pass, and Abimelech's king. And then it says God stirred up animosity, or really God sent an evil spirit to kind of create division between Abimelech and the citizens of Shechem. So they start to rebel against him. And we get some insight in the text, and we'll come back to this. It says, God did this in order that the crime against Gideon's 70 sons might be avenged on both Abimelech and, and this, the citizens of this city. All right? So now God starts to create division. And so the citizens of this town start to rebel against Abimelech and attack these traitors that are going through the area, uh, upsetting the trade, upsetting commerce, hurting the economy. And Abimelech gets ticked about that. Now a new guy moves into the area, just introduced here. Now Gaul moves in with his family, with his clan into the city, and earns people's trust. Right? So now there's a time in the year where there's a Canaanite festival where they gather grapes. And what happens in those festivals is people get hammered. That's how they worship these gods, is they just get crazy drunk. They drink. It's this absolutely hedonistic spectacle, and they just consume, and that's, that's, that's one of the ways they worship. Uh, the Canaanites worshiped at this time for these kinds of gods. So while they were eating and drinking, they cursed Abimelech. So remember, these are his citizens who rebelled against him, and they start cursing Abimelech, and this guy starts to get that, like, wine confidence where he's like, yeah, who is this Abimelech? Where is he? He's like, I could take that guy. Like, I'm at, it's, it's, it's the kind of, like, schoolyard boasting that, like, we've all heard at somebody. He's like, I could take him. You, let him show up with his army. He's like, I could take him. That guy's a nobody. And he, 
starts calling out the, the governor of his town, Zebul, and he's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Abimelech, he's not even from here. Remember, Abimelech appealed to these people by saying, hey, my mom is from your town. Like, I'm one of you. And this guy goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wasn't his dad an Israelite? He's not even one of us. So side note is I find it fascinating that Abimelech is, is uh, not Israelite enough for them to worry about him, so they make him king. And now he's too Israelite to continue to be king. So the governor hears all this talk, and, and Gaul's kind of riling people up and getting people angry and frustrated. You're doing a great job hanging in, really. I'm really proud of you. And the governor kind of sends secret word to Abimelech. He's like, hey, here's what's happening. You got to do something, or this is going to get really bad. So, and he gives him some military advice, some strategic advice. So Abimelech sends his troops by night. They take up these kind of hidden positions because they're going to set an ambush. And now Gaul goes out to the gate because he's one of the important people of the city, and the commerce and business was conducted in the gate of the city. So he goes out to the gate in the morning, and he sees these troops coming, although they've been hidden, so he can't see them till they're close. And Zabul, who's Abimelech's deputy, is like, no, 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 don't worry about it. That's nothing. Don't worry about it. So Gaul kind of like, okay, I guess I don't have to worry about it. But then he finally realizes, oh, shoot, these are troops coming. This is, this is not good for us. And this is just this is my personal note that I want to share with you. Verse 38 says, Zabul says to him, where's your big talk now, you who said, who is Abimelech, that we should be subject to him? I mean, it's, he's straight up mocking him, right? And the, the context is, the way he says it is, there's a sarcasm in the Hebrew that he means like, like uh, what, where, where's your big mouth now, buddy? Huh? What happened? That's way funnier than you're laughing. You should be laughing. It's very funny. It's very funny. So Gaul leads the citizens of Shechem out, and they fight Abimelech. Abimelech chased everybody back to the, to the gate as they went into the city for, for safety. He killed a lot of people, and they, the people of Shechem think it's over. But the next day, when they go out to their fields because they think they're safe, Abimelech had been hiding. They'd set an ambush, and so they slaughter even more people. Now they rush into the city. They, kill, they go through the city killing people. They force people back into the tower, the citadel of the city, they trap people inside there, and then he says, you know, I'm not done here. So he takes his men, they cut down branches uh, from trees on a surrounding mountain, they pile it at the base of this, this tower, and they burn it and kill everyone inside. It's nuts. And as if that's not enough, they tear down the city, they salt the ground, which was both symbolic but also had a practical thing to, so that nothing would live there again. He destroys this city, says about a thousand men and women also died. Just wipes the city off the face of the map. But that's not enough because then he goes to another city, the next city over, he besieges that and he captures that. And inside that city, there was a strong tower again that it, it, these had a citadel where people kind of went and hid inside. And they locked themselves, but this time they'd heard what had happened, and so they climbed to the roof so they could kind of try and fight back. And at that point, as he approached the tower to set fire to it again, so this guy's on a murderous rampage. A woman drops the upper portion of a millstone on his head and cracks his skull, basically it almost kills him. And so he says to his armor bearer, the guy who's bringing his shield, he's got his bag of stuff with him, he's like, quick, kill me. I'm, this, I'm not making this up. This is in the Bible. Quick, kill me so they can't say a woman did it. Because when you're dying, I mean, that's really what matters, is who did it. Like, that's really what matters in that moment. It, and so his armor bearer kills him. And it says, when the Israelites saw that Abimelech was dead, they went home. Yeah, that's the story. That's the story Jacob gave me to talk about. It's a nuts story. I mean, it's an absolutely nuts story. There's a couple of things I want to explain and give some context on, and then we'll talk about why this is worth, worth kind of digging into. One of the things that's important is to, to know that in Judges 8, previously in Judges, the people of Israel had said to Gideon, hey, be our king. It said no sooner had... Oh, sorry, I got to add myself. Um, uh, okay, no, I'm going I'm to get to that later. Sorry, I got to add myself. Um, the, the Israelites had prostituted themselves to Baal and called them Baal of the Covenant, which is a deeply insulting thing to God, who had made a covenant with his people. Covenant's a legal contract where God said, I will keep both halves. You, you can't possibly keep your half. I'm going to keep your half for you. 
and has repeatedly moved towards his people in love and grace and mercy and rescued them. Anytime in the Bible you see the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that language is intentionally used to remind people of the promises God had made to them and kept. So now, to, like, to thumb their nose at, at God, they call Baal, Baal of the covenants. There's a deep brokenness here, right? Gideon was this great guy, right? A good man who God used in a powerful way to lead his people and bring about a 40-year peace, but he was also a deeply complex man. He led Israel into idolatry in chapter 8. He really started leading them on the wrong path. He said he had 70 sons. And that's either one exhausted uterus or that's a lot of other women involved. And we know he had a sex slave, at least one. But how, this guy's a prophet. Like, how is that possible? Like, that's what's taking place here. That's, that's the context that this is happening. And it's the, the people that are, that are involved. This guy did horrible stuff. Horrible stuff. Eventually killed by a woman who threw a, a millstone on his head. And what and a deeply ironic twist, it, where he wished it not be known that a woman killed him, that did not come true because 2 Samuel eleven twenty one, 21, basically just a book later on in the Bible, says, who killed Abimelech? Didn't a woman drop an upper millstone on him from the wall? People know. People know. It's a crazy story. So what do you do with this? Like, have fun applying that. When I was first reading through this, I'm like, um, what, where, like, where are we going with this? But one thing hit me that's really important. There are times that often that we want life, but in particular, when we come to faith, we want it to be neat, clean, tidy, moral stories that have a, a nice ending that wrap up in 30 minutes so I can go to sleep sound at night. But that's not life, and it's not the Bible either. We are deeply complex, nuanced people. We want things to be simple, but we know that we're not. So what do we do with this? Why is this included? And I want to give you a different kind of approach to preaching. Rather than points, I want to give you two questions. When we get a text like this, and there's going to be text, there's going to be stuff in the Bible where you're like, what the heck do I do with that? There's always two questions we can ask. One is, the first is, what does this story tell us about ourselves? What does this story tell us about ourselves? And I don't mean, we often want to read ourselves into it, right? We like the story where it's like, well, Abraham did good, and so I should do good like Abraham. And sure, that's nice and tidy. But what does this tell us about who we are, about the human condition, about the nature of being a person? I think it says several things. First, I think it says, like Abimelech, we as humans crave power and control. We want what we want when we want it. We have the capacity to hurt people to get what we want. We often don't respond well when challenged or confronted. Embarrassment, disappointment, and pain can lead to anger, which causes us to lash out and to escalate things. I mean, think about where we are culturally. Think about the myriad stories about the powerful abusing their authority or their influence. I just read something this morning about a famous author who now multiple women have come out accusing him of sexual assault. Or think about how polarized we are as a culture, where disagreement is now an excuse to hate or humiliate or hurt others. Romans 7 kind of encapsulates this when Paul's talking. He says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer my, I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. There's a battle within us. We have the capacity for those things. Right? We have the capacity for that. Augustine, a third century early church bishop, outlined what's in the church is called the, the doctrine of original sin. But this idea that we're, we're born with this brokenness, that we can't heal or make right on our own, right? That we're, our hearts are drawn inward, our hearts are drawn selfish. Now, culturally, we push back on that, but that's what Augustine outlined, right? That we have this need in us to be rescued, then we cannot provide that rescue. Thomas Hobbes, who's a 17th century British philosopher, had this idea that people need to be governed, have it, I think, as a, a, the result of the sin being in the world and the brokenness that came from the, the fall in Genesis, that we have a need to have those over us. And he, 
says this, in, in short, he's talking about the inherent kind of selfishness of humanity. He says, in short, their passions magnify the value they place on their own interests, especially their near-term interests. At the same time, most people in pursuing their own interests do not have the ability to prevail over competitors, nor can they appeal to some natural common standard of behavior that everyone will feel obliged to abide by. There is no natural self-restraint, even when human beings are moderate in their appetites. For a ruthless and bloodthirsty few can make even the moderate feel forced to take violent preemptive action in order to avoid losing everything. The self-restraint even of the moderate then easily turns into aggression. In other words, no human being is above aggression and the anarchy that goes with it. He's saying we have that capacity within us. He's kind of the father of modern political science and the idea of the consent of the governed comes from him. But he says part of that is we surrender individual liberty to a greater authority because we can't be trusted with it in the whole. Harvard and Yale did a set of studies, right? That they want to dig into. Are people inherently good or are they or inherently bad? Like, what's that shake up? And so they tried to break that down into uh, selfishness versus cooperation. Which one is intuitive, all right? And so I want to read you from, some of the, from their results. We can boil the complexities of basic human nature down to a simple question. Which behavior, selfishness or cooperation, is intuitive? And which is the product of rational reflection? In other words, do we cooperate when we overcome our intuitive selfishness with rational self-control? Or do we act selfishly when we override our, intu our intuitive cooper uh, cooperative impulses with rational self-interest? So they set out that question. And they say the results were striking. In every single study, faster, that is more intuitive, decisions were, were associated with higher levels of cooperation, whereas slower, more reflective decisions were associated with higher levels of selfishness. These results suggest that our first impulse is to cooperate, that Augustine and Hobbes were wrong, and that we're fundamentally good creatures after all. Okay, sounds good. But like good scientists, they go, well, let's keep digging into that, right? Because I think there is a bias in this, where we, is not even from these scientists, but from people. We want to see ourselves as good. Who wants to wake up, look in the mirror, and go, you are just the worst? I mean, sometimes we go through seasons where we say those things, but that's not a thing we want to say. But what I find interesting is the researchers then did another study to try and understand if people were intuitively cooperated out of a natural goodness or because that's a socially rewarded behavior, okay? And their results say, this suggests that cooperation is the intuitive response only for those who routinely engage in interactions where this behavior is rewarded that human goodness may result from the acquisition of a regularly rewarded trait. In other words, where they had previously said, hey, it seems like people are really wired to be good and cooperative, they go, well, it turns out because they get something for it. In my opinion, these studies illustrate the dichotomy at the core of human experience. We have the Imago Dei imprinted on us, so there is a goodness and also, we have free will and a unique independence that often leads to selfishness. We want to be reductive and believe that we are good, that, sorry, that we are good and bad people are just bad. And the reality is that people are far, far, far more complex than that. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, a Russian author, says this, If only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts to the heart of every human being. So what does a Russian author have to do with Judges 9? We look at Abimelech and go, we all have that capacity in us. We all have that capacity in us. I think what those Harvard studies show is that situation often dictates our response to things. When it's easy to be good and altruistic and kind, we are, and when it's not, we can struggle with that. There is a war in our soul that Paul talked about in Romans 7, 7 when I read that, that we want to do good, but we often find ourselves not because we act in a, in a, in a self-interest, a self-preservation, for a lot of different reasons, out of fear. What will people think if they know? Out of selfishness, I want what I want. But that capacity is within all of us. So we read about Abimelech, we read about the, the Shechemites, and we go, what's more likely? That this was a group of a thousand horrible people from their hair down to their toes, just rotten to the core, 
who got what they deserved, or these are regular people who found themselves in a situation where they made a series of increasingly awful choices to pursue, to pursue something, even a good thing, to pursue safety, to pursue freedom, to pursue those things in the wrong way. Like, what's more likely? That capacity is in all of us. And so when we read this, we go, what does this tell us about us? That we have that capacity in us. The capacity to hurt. The capacity to wound. The capacity for selfishness. The, and if you need proof of that, have children. It's a, a, such a great picture of like, oh, that's what I'm like. Okay, boy, that's difficult. That's, wh that's who we are. But what does this story tell us about God? Because I don't want to just leave it on a depressing note. That's like, all right, would you, how is church? Oh, great, we're awful, and we all have the capacity to be monsters. What does the story tell us about, about God? I think what's really interesting about this story is that God is the, the main seat of power, though he's barely in the story. Right? God's not even mentioned until verse 7. When Jotham was talking about it, it says, listen to me so that God may listen to you. Right? What do we have in that moment? God being engaged and in, in, in offering them grace. God owes them nothing. They are, they are running towards destruction as fast as they can. Making, like, they've committed mass murder. I mean, like, I can't stress enough. Like, this is awful what has happened here. But God intercedes. God raises up Jotham, raises up a son of Gideon to really kind of be like his father, to step in and say, you don't have to do this. There is another way. You don't have to take this road. That's God showing grace to them, stepping into the story in a way he didn't have to, in a form he didn't need to, to love them when they clearly had not deserved it. So this presence of, of grace hovers over this story. And then the next thing we, we see God mention, he's only mentioned three times. In verse 23, God stirred up animosity between Abimelech and the citizens of Shechem. It really sent an evil spirit to cause d division and tension between the people and Abimelech. Why did he do that? Thankfully, this is one of those times where they make it very clear. God did that in order that what the crime against Gideon's 70 sons, the shedding of their blood, might be avenged on their brother Abimelech and on the citizens of Shechem. Why did, they, why did God do this? For judgment. A reckoning was coming, right? A reckoning was coming. God knew what would have happened. Now, for some people, God sent an evil spirit. It's hard to understand. So I'm going to briefly talk about that, okay? I want to I be clear. James says God, God will not tempt someone to evil. That's not how God works. In God's character and his holiness and his perfectness and his goodness, God doesn't, God's not us. God doesn't, like, tempt people to mess up. God's not Lucy pulling the football away from Charlie Brown at the last minute, like, laughing about it. And that's how old I am. That it's like, man, you know. God, but God's not looking for us to fail. God doesn't give us a pop quiz so that he can look at it with his, with his teacher friends in the lounge and go, everybody bombed. That's not how God works. So then how do we reconcile this? There's many examples in scripture of where God hardened Pharaoh's hearts, right? Or God sent an, evil, or sent an evil spirit or did something like that. And I think the implication is there's language that God gave them over. What that means is their decisions have been made, Right? Their hearts have turned from God. They have hardened. There is, they have committed evil. There is evil in their hearts. God gave them over to those things that they wanted to do. Really, it's God allowed them to be who they chose to be. Does that make sense? So it's not God tripping them up. It's God saying, listen, I don't want this for you, and I have tried to keep you from this, but if this is where you are insistent on going, go ahead. And God did that as a means to bring judgment on them, to hold them ultimately accountable for what had happened. So we see a God that's very engaged in the story, very engaged. And we know that because at the very end, it says, thus God repaid the wickedness that Abimelech had done to his father. God reconciled that story. God kind of closed those accounts there. So what, do we, what does the story tell us about God? That he's engaged that he's present, that he cares, that he hears them. One of the things I think we struggle with is that we are finite beings who are loved by an infinite God, right? And so we live our lives on a linear timeline, right? Time flows one direction. We move this way. Five minutes from now, it will be different than five minutes ago, and I can only move that way until someone buys a DeLorean and 
invents a flux capacitor. Like, time moves one way, but God sits outside of time. God is not bound by time. God created time, right? And if you think about that too long, they're going to find you dead in your bathtub because your brain exploded. Like, that's a nuts thing to think about. But God exists outside of time. So for us, where we go, God, where are you? Why aren't you doing anything? Because we are finite, limited beings on this timeline going, my life is short. Do something now where God is not bound by the, the same sense of time that we are. And so God did move. God did intercede. God hadn't forgotten them. God was present. My favorite picture of, of that in Judges, in chapter 9, really, is Jotham, is Gideon's son. God sends a son to intercede, a son who positions himself between people and the evil they intend to commit. To give people, sorry, the, the people are given a chance to do the right thing, to stop doing a terrible evil before they start. That Jotham is a son who steps into the story, tries to protect people from themselves, to remind them of a greater truth, to appeal to their, their better nature. God shows incredible grace to give people something they don't deserve, a chance to live differently, a chance to experience a richer, fuller life, and a chance to avoid judgment. The God who would send Jotham is the same God who would later send Jesus to fulfill what Jotham could only do in part. Jesus is God saying, I'm not going to give you a choice anymore. I'm just going to do the whole thing for you. Essentially, he's like, you can't be trusted. And I know that about you, and I love you, and so I'm going to make this possible for you. My son, he's not here today, so I'd say this. Don't tell me I told this. He had to mow the lawn the other day, and I reminded him a couple days, and he's been a little forgetful about it. And I told him, you're going to owe me $10 from your spend if you forget, because we've talked about this a bunch. It was very clear yesterday he was on the path to forgetting, and I don't want to have to give him a consequence. So rather than let him make a bad choice, in this particular instance, it's like I reminded him again and asked him, hey, would you go do it right now? And he didn't want to, and he did not enjoy that. But I, as his dad, I'm going, I love you, and I don't want you to experience the pain that is coming your way if you don't listen to me. I want to protect you, and so I'm going to step in here and do for you what you should do but aren't capable of doing for a lot of different reasons, and that's okay, because I love you and I care for you. That's not always the thing to do in every situation as a parent, but in this particular situation, it was. And that's what God does for us, that Jotham is a picture of Jesus who would intercede for us once and for all forever, who wouldn't just say you don't have to do this, but would say I will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. God loves us that way. I'm trying to think of an illustration to help this make sense. All right, so think of the stock market. And I am so far out of my area of expertise here as to be like a little uncomfortable. We're not filming this, are we? So I want to show you a picture. This is a, the growth of the stock market since uh, 1887, right? Shows you how it's moved. Um, there's different indexes. I think this is the Dow Jones, but it's just, I b barely understand what that means. Just things are going up, right? Things are going up. But I'm, let me, can we move on to the next picture? Okay, so here's another way to look at it, right? Things are moving in this direction. Now, what's, it, what's nuts about this graph, if you look at it carefully, is this is not a linear graph. This is a logarithmic graph because the growth is exponential. Now, I studied ancient Mediterranean studies, so if you need a definition of what logarithmic means, ask Jacob, because I don't know. Um, but it's basically, it's increasing by orders of magnitude. And the reason they do this is to show fluctuation, because if you actually show it, uh, what this was plotted out, can you go to the next one? Uh, no, go back, go to the, where's the, one more, maybe go, yeah, this one. This is what it would actually look like if you plotted it out. Like this is, where it's in even increments, right? This is the growth of the stock market. It's all moving that way, right? Now go back to the last one for me. Why do I show you that? Because this is this was Black Monday in 1987. So the stock market had the largest single day drop in history. It was like $1.5 billion in market capital were lost on one day, and they still don't even really know why. This is your life. How do things feel? Pretty awful. I mean, you're, you're riding high and then you plummet down. Like, this is a terrible moment. Life is miserable right now. Life is utterly painful. You're going through this, you're going, God, where are you? Why don't you care about me? You know, 
things, all right, things are a little bit better, but then they go down again, and you're like, is, am I just going to keep going down? Is this what my life is like now? Am I, am I just a, a mess for the rest of my life? Are things just going to fall apart? Is this, is this just is this my lot? Is this my future? You look at this. Life is overwhelming and discouraging, and you feel abandoned. You go, God, why don't you care about me? Why would you let this happen? Why aren't you doing anything? Go back. Go, go to the next one. This is who God is. Right? This is who God is. This is the big picture. God is moving this way. This growth is astronomical. This graph doesn't even, it's not even useful. That's why they had to make the other one, because the growth is so significant. God, this is who God is. God is moving us this way. God is growing us and always moving us upwards. And when we focus on the micro, when we take one day, we are overwhelmed and consumed by the pain and the loss and what we are going through when we lose sight of the fact that God is a God of growth, of exponential growth, of radical growth. This is who God is. That just hits me. Because Bethany and I have gone through just a hard couple years. We're in a great season now, but it took going through a hard couple years to get there. And I had those moments of going like, God, where are you? Why wouldn't you do anything? How could you let this happen? This is wrong, and you know it's wrong. Nothing in this story says anything that Abimelech did wasn't heinously, horrifically awful. He is not a good guy. Like, this is awful, awful, awful stuff. And I've had this, God, why, why don't you care enough to do it? You're not, you know this isn't right. You know this isn't true. You're not doing anything about it because I'm consumed by the small picture. And it looks like my life is tanked and it looks like I've fallen off a cliff. And I, 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 even, there are moments even where I felt like I had. But I also lost sight of who God was over time because God always makes sense in retrospect. Right? God's work in our lives makes sense in retrospect. Frankly, it only makes sense in retrospect often because we need the perspective of seeing how God has been faithful incrementally. We live and die with the, the peaks and valleys. That's why the, every, like, I don't, don't take any financial advice from me, but the thing that I heard from, I'm the ideal financial services client because I'm like, I don't care. I don't know. Just don't lose my money. Like, I don't, I don't, just I'll do whatever you say. And what they say is don't pay attention to it. Right? Because you can't live and die with one day movement. You're looking at this over 30 years, over 40 years, over 50 years. We're looking in the aggregate. Because when I'm able to stop and look back, I see God has been faithful again and again and again and again and again. And the moments where I felt like God had abandoned me, God was at work just in ways I didn't want or ways I didn't see. That's who God is. That's who God is. Several years ago, my son started reading the Harry Potter books. And he just cranked through them. And he fin anybody read, read or watched Harry Potter? Come on, don't be shy. I read it. I love them. They're great. Okay, my son finished his book six. You've had a lot of time to read these. I'm not going to spoil it, but like I, I want to because you've had a lot of time. Like 20 years is a fair, like, anyway, I'm not going to do it. But there's a one character. He does not like Snape at all. Like can't stand. So he gets done book six. He's like, Snape is the worst. Ah, oh, I can't believe it. Snape is awful. He is just, I, Dad, like this... Tell me it gets better. Like, this is just, how, how could he get away with this? This is just disgusting. Snape is the worst. I'm like, dude, just keep reading. It gets better. Just keep reading. And he's like, I don't even know if I want to read it. Snape, it just, you ruined it. Just keep reading, man. It gets better. Everything will make sense one day. Doesn't make sense to you now, but you're not done the story. Everything may, will make sense one day. And when we come across something like Judges 9 in the Bible, we take the long view. We take the, that big view of God and we ask those questions. All right, God, what does this say about me and what does this say about you? Because we see here that, that God is faithful and he's present and he's merciful and he's just. He does not have to be and yet he is. A story that at first glance makes no sense and you're just like, why? like I feel like I could live a full life without knowing this actually becomes richer to see the way that God orchestrated this and worked through the story, how he was present the whole time so that when we are in seasons of life where we wonder where God is, we can know, hey, he has been faithful, not just to me, but to others. And the Bible is just a huge, gigantic story of God's faithfulness. By the way, would you pull out that picture of the millstone? Because I want to show you what it looked like. Um, 
This is the upper millstone. There's a big millstone that would sit in. This is about a 10-inch millstone. It can kind of rotate like this. And that's what the woman grabbed as a weapon. And I tell you, she's got good aim because she just cranked him right on the head with that millstone. So just can't go home without knowing what a millstone looks like. No larger point, just that's a millstone. <laughs> not the millstone. I don't know if it's, you know, it's not like a Bimlex blood on it, but that is a millstone. So as we wrap this up and we think about this, like what, I want to leave you with some questions. So some things to think about. Like where are you chafing against God? Where are you chafing against God's plan for your life or what God's doing in your life? Where are you rubbing up against frustration with God? I, I don't hear you or see you. Where have you hurt others through the pursuit of what you think you want? Whether through things you've said or done or attitude. Where have you hurt others through the pursuit of what you think you want? Where are you struggling with God for control? Because so much of life as a follower of Jesus is fighting God for the steering wheel. Where is God asking you to trust him in the short term, even when it's hard? Because I would say, as I think about my own life, trusting God only matters for us when it's hard. Trusting God when it's easy doesn't, like, if that's not a God thing, that's a me thing. I don't give him the credit for that. Trusting God, it only matters in my life when, when I'm trusting God when it's hard, because that's when it costs me something to do it, because that's when I realize it's actually real and not just another thing. And the last question is, how would it change you to see God's overwhelming goodness and faithfulness over time? How would it change you to see God as the stock market moving up? Not to focus on the micro, on the individual day, on the losses, on the, va on the valleys, and not even to focus on the peaks, but to focus on God's overwhelming faithfulness over time. Why do we read the Bible? Why do we do this stuff? Because we can, when we go through a season, we can remember. I guarantee you there were people in, in Judges 9 going, God, where are you? And we can look at the story and say he was there the whole time. He was there the whole time. And if he's been there for all of this, these stories in the Bible, for these real people, if he's been there in people we know, if he's been there in our own lives, why won't he be there in the future? Why don't you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father God, we thank you for that truth. That th this is just a deeply unsettling and, and ugly story. But Lord, in the midst of it, there's something incredibly beautiful. That you intercede. That you step into that story when you don't have to. Just like you do for us. Father, would you challenge us to see your faithfulness in ways that, that can be hard? Would you challenge us, Lord, to lean on your goodness? Would you challenge us, Lord... Give us a bigger picture of who you are, Lord. We focus on the micro way too often. I know I do that, Lord. Help me to focus on your greatness, on your majesty, on your faithfulness over time, because you have proven yourself over and over and over and over and over again. You're just asking me to trust you. Lord, would you help us to do that? We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of
Singing, praying, hearing the word this morning is to worship God, to take captive every thought and to remember that there is a God, the creator of the universe that is sovereign over all. He cares about all that happens in your life. And as we worship him, take that room that you have received. Take that grace that you have received today and share it with those around you. Be gracious. Be gracious. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.